Can y'all hear me? Okay, now my first question is, how many of you people are actually here to hear me and how many of you are just here because it's a nice place to sit and look at your comics? Okay. Um, can y'all move up a little bit, please, so I can actually talk to you? That's good. Let's see what else I could do. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. I don't have a canned presentation or anything. I can talk to you about my new book, which is up there, for a little bit. Um, but I usually, then I'm supposed to talk to you about the park, uh, so I can do that. And that'll get me off my obligations. But after that, generally what I'd like to do is just open up the floor to questions, because you folks have a better idea what you'd like to hear than I do. Um, my name is Joyce Bradner. It's been all of my life. It's been Joyce Bradner. Never changed my name when I get married. Um, and I am Harvey Picard's widow, which makes me a character in both the movie and comic book series American Splendor, also a character in four theatrical productions and an opera. If you didn't know that. And also a uh, online um, RPG, which I thought was pretty cool because uh, character Harvey and it just goes into the living room and lies down on the sofa while Joyce runs around and does all the activity, which is kind of the way it was. Um, talk about my, my own latest book first. I, it took me a while to get back to being able to write again because I was very involved in it. Well, a lot of caretaking and stuff, but, and people always say, "Oh, did you, did you resent the fact that you took time off several times from your, you know, glorious career to do other stuff?" But of course, absolutely not. I'm a feminist, and I think that any work a woman does has value, and it really doesn't matter if I'm writing a book or cleaning a toilet or taking care of a kid. Whatever I chose to to be doing at that particular time um, was important to me. I, I also had you know, a whole other career, a whole other background that a lot of people never got through American Splendor. So I was actually pretty busy doing other stuff. Um, I wanted to write the book that eventually became known as Second Avenue Caper for a while, and I wasn't, uh, I'd always wanted to write a caper story, one of these A-team things. How many, has anybody in here read the book yet? Okay, cool. I wanted to write a caper. I wanted to write one of these things where people have different roles and they put on costumes and they get a van. The van's really important. You know, you have to dodge the cops and drive through here and there. And I realized that I had been sort of peripherally involved in the caper. Um, and that I, also had seen one of the bravest things I'd ever seen in my life happen. Um, and that most of the people involved were dead or dying, in the case of the primary storyteller in this book, um, my friend Ray is terminally ill. He did leave, he st is still alive. Um, the money that I got from the book really helped him with his, some of his medical stuff. And he's, happy with the way the book turned out. Um, and does anybody know what the story is about at all? No? See this is the part I love because when I go to when I go to students in classrooms, I say, okay kids, here's the book. Now I've explained to you Second Avenue is the neighborhood in New York's Lower East Side where this happened. A caper is, you know, it's a caper. It's like 18, it's you know. And then it's, the subtitle is When Goodfellas, Divas, and Dealers Plotted Against the Plague. Or I say, okay, now, what's Goodfellas code for? Mob, the mafia, yeah. My friends really did do a favor for the mafia in order to make things happen. Actually, in order to save people's lives, they did that. Um, and then, Divas, and now the kids go, ah, Divas, 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 and then, RuPaul's Bradner? Yeah. 
RuPaul can be considered a diva. Yeah, it's a diva. Okay, and dealers, so they got this is a pot. <laughs> okay, so we got mafia, RuPaul, pot, plotting against the plague. Okay, class, tell me about the plague. 13th century in England, the Black Plague, and I said, yeah, okay, you tell me a story in which we've got RuPaul, dealers, and the mob in the 13th century, bringing out the dead. And that's where they get stuck, because they don't know what I lived through, many of you lived through, um, and many more people did not live through, they do not know. My, my friend was working in a hospital, um, and they brought in somebody with an illness nobody could identify. It would turn out that he was treating patient number 24 with AIDS. Um, coincidentally, my friend Ray, who also in his, you know, his his day job, he like Harvey had a hospital day job, but his real passion was being a playwright. Um, Ray was approached at lunch one day by this kind of sleazy doctor who got his diploma at Guadalajara Diploma Mill in Mexico, and he didn't really want to be a doctor. In fact, he says, I can make a whole lot more money dealing weed, and I got really great connections in Mexico, guys I, you know, I knew down there I trust, so. But I don't have any friends. You, Ray, seem to have a lot of friends, so, uh, I'll supply you and you can sell it. Ray and his boyfriend, Roy, or I'm sorry, his, we called him Ben in the book, Ray. Um, and Ben was a, uh, a jazz musician. He says, what well, you know, we do this, I don't have to play so many wedding gigs, we can make some decent money, just sell to people we know. So they had this little pot dealing business going on. Um, well, when the plague hit, and like I said, they're among the first people to realize Ray had taken this story about patient 24 home to, we had this big round kitchen table where everybody would hang around and talk and dish and gossip and you know, figure out who's got an apartment and stuff like that. And there was one guy there who was really erudite, his name, nickname was The Scholar, his name was Jacob, and he had heard some things from the East Coast or from the West Coast papers and some other stuff, and he said, you know, if this is what it looks like, half of us are going to be dead in five years. So they began to immediately try to find out what the hell this was. Nobody had a clue at that time. I mean, did, how did you get it? Was it kissing, screwing, um, was it a parasite, was something like, you know, this weird amoebic dysentery that one of the guys brought back from, you know, a, you know, a tour with the, his band or something like that. Nobody knew. They were trying to figure it out. And friends started to die real fast. Um, so, with the money my guys were making from selling weed, uh, they set up a fund to take care of people, firstly to bury people, because people were being put in potter's graves. I mean, to be gay in the early 80s, a lot of people had parents who were very intolerant, and they had nobody when they were dying, nobody to bury them, nobody to care for them, except your friends. I mean, this is really so much a book about chosen family, people hanging together. Um, as well as about a kind of grassroots activism by any means necessary. And this particular means didn't mean violence. I think what attracted me to doing the story at the time I did this was just before Obamacare, and I was working with um, these punk kids who were like dumpster diving and squatting, and they didn't have any health care, and some of them were working real hard with, they were writing, you know, zines about things like okay, if you have immune system, some compromised friends living in the house, you have to let them know that, you know, the food here came from a dumpster, it may not be good for them. Um, practicing safe sex also means having really clean fingernails and cutting them and stuff like that if you're gonna be having sex with somebody who's immune system compromised. These are like 20-something year old kids trying to take care of each other, and hell, that's where I came, came in on with this stuff, with, you know, the plague that we went through. So, the money went to bury people, it went to take care of people, and eventually there was a question about uh, what kind of drugs, if any, would work. And AIDS was not a priority 
for the U.S. government or the medical uh, community at all because it was just seemed to be just a gay boy disease. It was GRID is what they were calling it at that time, you know, great gay related immune disorder, the, you know, gay cancer. Um, so nobody cared. It wasn't really until cute little girls, you know, from the club scene were getting it. Little, you know, little white kids, you know, looked like Molly Ringwald. I think she played one in the movie. You know, dies of AIDS. Um, you know, I, that anybody really looked at it. But uh, the drugs seem to be out of the country, and some of this crosses over into that really awful movie with Matthew McConaughey. How many of you ever saw that Dallas Buyers Club? Um, you know, it's like the whole thing was kind of invented so that McConaughey could get an, get an Academy Award, and he's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bad movie, anyway. <laughs> you know, somehow or other he has AIDS, but he manages, to, you know, to be very attractive to a young doctor who suddenly falls in, falls in love with him, he looks at his ulcers and sores on his skin, and says, move here for me. Um, but, uh, anyway. The drugs were, were mostly out of the country. I came up with the same thing when my sister Sybil uh, was dying of cancer, and we'd heard like there's a drug in Germany that might work, you know, those Hail Mary things, and how do we get this? And you can only bring in enough for maybe three months of treatment for personal use. So my guys first went down across the border and brought back as much as they could. Hell, they went down with uh, their, their mom, or his mom, a good Irish Catholic lady, and you know she still is calling Benny, you know Raymond's roommate, but <laughs> that she's like tops off her swag of drugs in the rosary, so she gets away the most, you know, going through. And they brought it back, and some of the stuff seemed to help and alleviate the symptoms. And you know, again, we have a lot of people with medical skills reading and trying to, you know, pra they're practicing medicine with a lot of license is what they're doing out of. Apartment on Second Avenue, where people are coming through for information, help, assistance. Um, at this point, the pot is selling at two different prices. If you're sick and you need it, you know, for the nausea from chemo or something like that, you get it for free. If you want to party with it, you pay like three times street value because everybody knows where the money's going to. Um, so they brought back. Uh, a, a drug in Spanish is called Milana. It was called ribavirin, um, and it was one of the antivirals. And it seemed to help, but there wasn't enough for everybody to take, and it wasn't available in, in uh, the states. And that's where the caper part comes in. Um, by this time, the scumbag doctor was so far up in the system that you know he was hooked in with the mob big time. So my friends did a favor for the mafia. And as a result, they got access to their drug smuggling apparatus, including vans that you could take the floors off and stuff the drugs into and stuff. And uh, they decided they were going to smuggle in the drugs people needed for treatment big time. Coming from a theatrical background, it wasn't too hard to among us find people who were actors, actresses who could be cast as ma and pa tourists who were sent down to Mexico to buy some crappy ponchos and you know fake turquoise and come back up. And that's when things began to get interesting, especially when two terminally ill people decided they were going to make a run rather than have anybody risk more risk arrest or anything like that with the smuggling. They said, let us go too. And it just continues to go on from there. Um, and you know, you'll see my younger self in there, you know, coming in through the place talking and noticing what was going on. I always tend to put myself in some of these stories because then I can tell people, yeah, I was there, this is how it happened. Uh, I did a comic book called Real War Stories. And did anybody ever read any of my stuff? You want me to talk about Harvey? You read it? Okay. Um, well, I'll switch over to talking about American Splendor in a minute. Um, I did a story about a young man who was documenting disappearances in El Salvador. When families, kids would just vanish, 
you know, because they spoke out politically and you'd find their bodies in, you know, mass graves or something, he would go down and identify the people, take the pictures and stuff. And uh, he disappeared. He was bringing humanitarian aid down to a clinic that was set up in a schoolhouse. And the treasury police, this is the, you know, the cops raided the place. And people got arrested. He was last seen out running for the jungle. Nobody knew if he got away or not. He just, he disappeared. And uh, we, you know, up in the States are very worried about this. So I went to my congressman's office. And I lied. Oh boy, did I lie. I pulled out the comic book and I said, okay, this is a comic book. You ever hear of Batman, Superman? This comic, people, everybody who's ever read Batman and Superman have read this comic book because they all read comic books together, okay? It's all those people know about this guy, Jorge. And see, he's real. And see, here's a picture of me talking to him. I'm real, too. So he's disappeared. And we need to tell everybody who likes Batman and Superman where he is. I don't know what the hell they did. But a week and a half later, I got a phone call. They said, we found him. And he's in LA. He's back. You know, We brought him into the States, and he's safe. And uh, I don't know. You know, it was like a, that was my own Hail Mary play. I couldn't have done this for every single person that disappeared, but I managed to exploit that. So I definitely kind of stick myself in. And sometimes it's because people will say things, this can't possibly be right, this is not true. And I'll say, no, see, these are real people I write about. Because my comics are always about you know, tough social issues, people I think need to be heard, people I don't want to have forgotten. And I run with the same code as a journalist would. Um, it's something that Joe Sacco, who began to do comics as journalism, a little after I did, I think, or maybe at the same time. You know, we've talked about, you know, really being strict about the facts and being straight about where we get our information. Um, that came in handy when one of my comics was brought in. I've got all this stuff for sale at my table, by the way, but um, so I can show you later. But uh, one of my comics ended up in a federal court in Atlanta, Georgia, because it was considered to be a threat to national security. And the argument being that if you're smart enough to read this series of interviews with vets and people who, you know, about US militarism, and decide that maybe Uncle Sam was not the way to get your college money. Maybe you find another way rather than you know going to the military. If you're smart enough to read my comic book, then you'd know that maybe you didn't want to enlist. And so somehow or other, I was eroding the number of smart people that were going into the U.S. military because you know it, if you read my comic and you still decided to go in, then you were dumb. <laughs> I don't know. I read something like that. But at any rate. Um, they also, the comics were being given out in high schools and on career day, people said, well, there's no such thing as a career for peace, which is an issue that Harvey took up in a book he did called Macedonia, which a woman who was getting him, uh, a graduate degree in peace studies is mocked, you know, saying there's no such thing as, you know, making peace. And she said, well, what if we went to a country that almost had war and we studied how that was prevented? And that's where she ended up in Macedonia. Anyway, um, when, it, when the comic book went to trial, and uh, we'd put a story in there about a particularly brutal form of hazing of young recruits on naval vessels, um, greasing and inking. And this is like dumb jock stuff. You know, they take, jump the new guy, sodomize him with a grease gun, and, you know, paint his genitals with printer's ink, hang him upside down, something like that, just, you know, a little guy that didn't fit in, or the young kid or something. And they said, well, we made the whole thing up. And of course, I had by then received letters from therapists treating guys who had cracked up while in the Navy because this happened, and they're telling the shrink, oh, God, no, I'm, they made me gay. 
they were, you know, the, you know, and then they just put the string showed on my comic, and they said, yes, this happened to me, and then they were able to begin treatment and start getting better. So, uh, the military is not known for paying attention to detail a lot of times, and we brought their own records of a military um, court-martial of a husband and wife who had both gone AWOL from a vessel that they served on. One was a seaman apprentice first class, the other was a fireman apprentice first class. And they went AWOL together because the wife was scheduled to undergo a shipboard initiation ritual was described as, you know, greasing and inking. And the commanding officer at the time said, hey, this is a tradition, this happens to everybody, lady, if you can't, you know, if you can't get with the program, you don't belong in this man's Navy. Now, to the Navy's credit, they did not penalize the couple for going AWOL. They did whatever they did, but there's this Lieutenant Colonel Cullen, who's a spokesman, you know, for the Department of Defense, and here's the Department of Defense's own records, and you know, he just sort of backtracks. Oh, uh, well, I'm Army. That's Navy. We don't know anything about that. So, <laughs> so then they withdrew their complaint. At any rate, paying attention to detail, getting it, you know, which is something I have in common with my late husband Harvey P. Carr. The truth is stranger, more interesting, and richer as a story than fiction. Um, a couple of things have happened, you know, since Harvey died. Uh, one of them, and again I have these at my table, is uh, the city of Cleveland Public Library decided to put out a series of library cards for great Ohio writers or great Cleveland writers. And they decided the first library card would be the Harvey P. Carr library card. So I actually have one, which is pretty cool. Um, little tab and everything. Um, and that was good because the library mattered a lot to us. Harvey did a lot of his writing there, so much so that uh, the branch of the library up in our town, Cleveland Heights, was First of all, the site of a Harvey P. Carr statue. Now, this is the thing that happens when you're the widow of somebody who's in like comics or a fan or has a fan base or something like that. Um, started out like these urban sophisticates and Hollywood people decided that they would create a statue of Harvey P. Carr and put it in the city. And I had already and this is not what Jewish people do. You don't just go, I mean, maybe you put your name on a cancer award and give them a lot of money, but you don't go erecting a statue to somebody after they die um, because your life is your, is, your, is your work, is what matters. Um, but there are a lot of reasons I didn't want that to happen. I mean, it seemed arrogant. It seemed a lot like RoboCop. You know, they made that big statue of RoboCop. The city of Detroit says, no, we don't want it. We don't want it. I had to go stick it somewhere. That was kind of embarrassing. But I did agree. I said, look, if we do this Vox Populi, if I put it out on for crowdfunding, let's say Kickstarter was really the only venue at the time, and people vote with little you know, nickels and dimes and stuff like that. We can build a statue that way. Then I'll know enough people, or at least the 900 some people that actually ended up contributing to the making of it, went for it. And it wasn't a statue of Harvey. When I took it over, I designed it and had it built as the Harvey P. Carr, this is the official name, Harvey P. Carr Comics as Art and Literature Memorial Desk. So, you know, I can show you later the pictures of it. It's, is a big giant bronze comic book page of the stories got Harvey walking through town saying, well, the comics are as good a form as literature or anything else. You can do anything with words and pictures. And then the other, she just sort of steps out last pair and goes, oh, hey, what do you want for my life anyway? Uh, <laughs> and uh, on the back of it is gridded chalkboard that kids can draw their own comics in. And then since it's on a desk that you can work at, the desk is perpetually supplied with art supplies. There's a center drawer that has two books Harvey read as a kid that really influenced him as a writer. And then another drawer that you pull out, and it's kind of like a little display case. It's got always glasses, a script, you know, a cassette from some recording, some of the awards that he got, a book he wrote, you know, a few other things like that in there. Um, 
But it's about the media, it's not about the man. It sets off a whole Harvey, um, the, you know, they did name their used book sale, the Friends of the Library bookstore, Harvey and Friends, and then it sets off a big graphic art, you know, a graphic novels collection um, at the library, because we have this great library where it's not like, uh, you know, Billy Ireland, you, you don't need white gloves, you just pick up the comics, you buy the books and you read them um, at the library. So that, that got put up. And I thought I was done with it. I thought I was done, I mean, I had to get two books out. I had to finish two books for him um, after he died. And then I do have this ton of unpublished Harvey stories um, and other things, other things, other projects to do. And uh, there was one other project I am committed to doing with an art gallery. Somebody, if you're interested in that, you can ask me about that later. Um, but I thought I was done for a while. And uh, then there's this thing going on in my neighborhood where they wanted for a couple of years now, they wanted me to put up a big plaque, a big replica of American Splendor Number no. One on the corner of the street, where it all began. And I don't want to go to my favorite restaurant or bookstore and go walk past a picture of Harvey sitting on, you know, the front cover of American Splendor every day. I mean, this is where I live. All right, you know, it's like people don't ask for my autograph on my doorstep unless. They want me to sign a petition or something. Um, but the thing is that down the block was an area that used to be where all the hipsters, all the hippies, all the beatniks, all the old Yiddish people, whoever were the, whoever were the outsiders, their kids used to hang out and talk, play. You know, and whether it's the guitar, the hacky sack, the sketching, something. I mean, I read, this is before this, you know. Um, now Harvey, when he was a young guy, used to come down there and flirt with the girls and stand around and tell his stories. And that gave him the idea of sitting down and, you know, writing some of them, mainly because he kept striking out with the girls he was telling his stories to. I'm one of the only people actually fell for his stuff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, that's, it was the hangout. It was the, it was the place to be. It was the outsider place. I mean, Rick Cleveland, who's got a couple of Emmys for his work on West Wing, Nurse Jackie, a couple of movies with Gene Hackman, you know, all that, that good stuff. He used to come over the bridge just to hang out in that little area in Coventry and get some of Harvey's comics, which inspired him because he didn't know until then that you know, working class people could tell their own stories too. And here he is, the son of an alcoholic bus driver and a drill press operator. And um, then he changes his name to Rick Cleveland and goes to Hollywood. And he's, you know, one of those, you know, those guys that's always got a series going, you know, six feet under, stuff like that. So that's the kind of place it was. It would just, it was a safe place to be different in the way that everybody else was different at the time. You know, they went through the period of time where everybody's sitting there wearing black. And around the time the flash mobs started happening, we had like half a flash mob for half a minute in the area, and then merchants went, well, you know, these kids aren't really bringing any income in, and there could be a hazard. So the next thing you know, the cops are blowing all the kids off the block. The urban redesign committee puts these things they're supposed to be planters, but what they call them are people bumpers, you know, architecturally designed things for, pop, for plants to grow out of, to keep people from congregating around. They just sort of broke up the whole area. So I said to him, okay, look, you, you want your Harvey P. car out there so it happened. Well, that's where it all happened, down here. And By using Harvey's name, I gave them a socially, politically acceptable reason to roll back the years and make it again freak friendly. 
so the planters are out. There's like a little amphitheater place you can sit. Next week, there's going to be a whole event. I can't confirm if Paul Giamatti is coming or not, but a whole bunch of people will be on stage telling stories like Harvey did in a band, and they'll show the movie and that stuff. And it's going to be Harvey P. Car Park. P. Car Park. Got a couple of people wrote into the newspaper, ooh, P. Car Park, that's so nasty. I'm going like, you know, they're naming it after parts of the human body. What part of the human body is a Harvey? You know, <laughs> but, but, you know, so this is kind of what you do when you're, you know, got this legacy and a bunch of boxes of, of files to deal with. Um, and you're still trying to write. That's kind of what it's been like for me. But, you know, I mean, I wish they'd call the place something like, I don't know, uh, Jonathan Swift Park or something like that. But no, it's going to be the Harvey P. Carr Park. And now you'll actually be able to go tour Cleveland and see where I used to work. And if you're like some of the weird people who like to come up to my house, or, you know, you can see where I used to live. God, we had this one kid showed up. <laughs> he goes, I'm out in my garden. So is our Danielle. He goes, is this where Harvey Peacock died? She goes, uh, uh huh. He goes, I want to be buried here. Oh. Stand up with the school. I said, that can be arranged now. <laughs> so you go there and you go down to the center. My, my old man's buried next to um, Elliot Ness. My joke being one untouchable next to another. <laughs> and uh, it says on it, you know, you know, life's about you know, women and work and being creative, you know, which is something that was one of Harvey's early stories on it. It's, uh, and it's written in idiomatic English, in other words, or somebody says this is the first beatnik slang, you know, headstone that anybody's ever seen in Lake, Lakeview uh, Cemetery, but there it is. Um, that's kind of cool. People come there and they leave little messages, leave pens, paper, things for them to write on, stuff like that. But other than that, it's, you know, what I do with this pseudo-celebrity is I try to make it possible for things to happen for other people. like. People are going to pay attention to me, and I endorse some young artist or writer or something like that. I can get them in through the door, you know, that we opened up, and that's always been my intention. I kept a diary since I was a kid. When I was 15, I wrote down a couple of things, you know, like dear future self. One thing I was to remember is that kids are a lot smarter than most adults seem to think they were. I, I've always remembered that. But the other one was, if I can ever get that door open, I'll hold it open as long as I can for anybody else behind me. And uh, that's probably one of the, Harvey's biggest joys was getting people recorded. Joe Maneri, whose music opens um, the movie, American Splendor, was a fabulous, completely undiscovered guy who was kind of at a loss to become a popular musician because he was severely handicapped with very, very bad ADD. Made it great on stage with his clarinet, but the guy could like hardly find his way out of a room without help with, the, with his wife. And of course, people thought she and I had a lot in common. And uh, so, the, the, you know, the, those are the joys. So that's what you do with the juice. You, you, you try and splash it on somebody else. You know, you use it as grease to open things for it because it doesn't really do you any good. Fame just means a bunch of assholes know your name. You know, money's another story. So, all right, so having just insulted everybody. <laughs> um, you can ask me close to anything, you know, uh, and I'll try and give you an answer. So I better have questions because that's what we're doing from now on. Yeah. Is your daughter involved with comics or writing? My daughter is a really skilled artist and a writer who does not want to do comics because um, she's got to really work to carve out her identity. She is, for those of you who, who, who saw the movie, you know that she is somebody who came to live with us. The real story is that uh, this stoned, Grew up, came to our doorstep, and had this little girl who 
behind him. You know, and he wanted he wanted because whenever he got high, he read R. Crumb comics. So he wanted Harvey to introduce him to R. Crumb because he knew that he and Crumb would be best friends. And he brought this little girl with me, and the day I met her, she said, "Hey, I need you to be my substitute mom. I don't want to live in a car with my dad." And I, you know, that's what happened. But she has a bio family, you know, that pulls in one direction. She has us, and she doesn't want to trade on her name. When the movie came out, she didn't tell anybody in school that she was in a movie. I said, why? She says, well, they don't think it's a real movie unless it's got some rapper in it or a car chase. I mean, she says, this is like an old people movie. It's not a real movie. We brought a couple of her friends down to the set to watch it. And they're like, this isn't, this isn't a real movie because, you know, they can't understand when you see cameras and stuff like that and people walking around with clipboards. It doesn't look like you're in, you know, inside a movie with Vin Diesel or something. So she, and I said, well, why else aren't you on television? She says, well, they'll just beat me up. <laughs> you know, they'll be jealous. They'll just beat me up. And so here's, the, I raised this kid who could not talk in school because the mean girls would make fair fun of her for having red shoes or something, but she could stand up and talk to Al Gore or 2,000 people on stage. As a writer, as a storyteller, as a visual artist, she's terrific. But she's decided to focus her skills for now. And she's going to be like me. She's, what she did learn from us is that you have to have another job if you're going to go out on the fringes of creativity and you want the freedom to be able to do what you want to do. You have to be able to pay the bills somehow. So she is, at this point, a traveling tattoo artist. And she does pretty interesting work. Um, but she also is working with me on a book that uh, will be probably not paneled comics, but what I call a profusely illustrated kids book. Uh, about something that happened when she was younger. It's, it's a book for young women about sexual assault. And when she was assaulted, after she came to live with us by a big boy in the, in the park, you know, threw the basketball and said, come on, let's go get it. Um, from the minute she hit the doorstep screaming and crying for me, all, you know, ripped up and everything, I had to figure out how to handle that. And I said, okay, Danielle, you're a crime fighter. You get, and I, we're going to get Blueberry Bear, and we are going to get your team together. First, we're calling the police. You make the report. You tell them what happened. Then we do this. Then we do that. And we were completely public and transparent with everybody. It wasn't one of these, you didn't do anything wrong, don't tell anybody things. Because I worked with beat up kids, and kids were tortured and abused in my other work, world, my other life, and I worked with sexual abuse survivors. And the kids hear them say, you didn't do anything wrong, but then they hear dad at night going, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. And they hear them through the walls, and they hear mom on the phone talking to her sister going, we can't tell our mother, we can't. She would just die if she knew. And the kids get the idea that they did something wrong, because all the adults are all upset around them. So I told her from the get, you know, what to say. I was sexually assaulted at the park. I'm okay now, but we're going to, you know, my team and I are going to kick his ass. And uh, we treated it like she'd had her purse snatched. And uh, I threw a party for her. She designed the cake, drinks. We invited, um, oh God, the cake is like Powerpuff Girls or something kicking butt. She, she drew the pictures for me. I had frosted green soda. Um, but we invited several women who are our best women adult friends who all told her stories. First, we all listened to her. We cheered her when she talked about kicking and fighting and clawing and screaming and who she ran to, because I taught her. I said, you run towards a family for help, you know, if you're out there on your own. We, she, we talked about this. You know, and we cheered her, we pat her on the back, and we gave her a magic wand and a crown and a cape and everything. And then all the women told stories. And, I think my, the funniest one was I, Daniel actually heard me on the phone calling up uh, Reverend Peggy, our elderly minister, and I said, Peggy, Daniel's not going to want to say anything about what happened to you because you're older and she's going to be, you know, really respectful, so you have to use the word penis. 
and you have to so she'll, so she knows that we're really talking about it, not pretend talking about what happened. So Peggy told her story. Peggy goes, well, I was young and had a flower in my hair. And a young man was driving me home from the dance, and he drove us out into the cornfield instead of home, and he showed me his penis, and I looked at his penis, and he said, I want you to touch my penis, and I did not want to touch the penis, because you don't have to touch a penis when you don't want to touch a penis. If a penis is attached to somebody you do not like, you do not have to have anything to do with that penis. It's not. So all the different women told their stories, and uh, what happened in the end, because you know the book details the things that happen when, with, with assault and, and for a younger kid's perspective, but we're honest, we're direct, we do use the penis word. It's a big problem when you're a, uh, you guys are getting an education. Um, it's a big problem when you've got an abused child and they don't use the proper words. They say, you know, my donut was poo-pooed or something. You don't know what the hell it is. You have to use an anatomically correct words to find out what kind of damage happened to the kids. So the book is written in a kid's perspective, but then there's notes for adults that any kid can read if they want to, but it's kind of like Don's Marginale, you know, like the annotated Alice in Wonderland. When this whole nightmare thing, you know, because I had told her when she came to live with me, she'd be safe, and you know, this happened anyway. But um, when it all happened in the end, the judge asked Danielle, See, we, I pulled records. He had done it before, and it was dismissed with prejudice, which is what happens when the victim will not appear in court and everybody knows you did it, so you have to get off on that. So it's dismissed with prejudice, meaning if the kid had been here, you'd have been locked up. And we knew he, we knew he had done it before. And the judge said to Daniel, um, what kind of punishment do you want for him? And what kind of punishment do you want from Joyce? I said, for me, I do not want him in an institution because there's rape culture in the boys' institution. I want him in this particular treatment program. I want no contact. I want his family to get a certain kind of family counseling on dealing with their son. You know, this is the stuff I want. Never, and we never did, you know, see or hear from again. And Daniel said, he's okay, what kind of punishment do you want? And Daniel goes on. Take away his radio privileges for two weeks. So I can't listen to any music. So that's what happened to the big horrible thing that's supposed to destroy a kid's life. We normalized it, we stabilized it. It was just like having a purse snatched because it was a crime, okay? You know, you can say it's a violation, you can say victim, all these things, but we didn't want her to be a victim. We wanted her to be a crime fighter. And so that's the book that we're working on. And the artist I'm working with is from Albania. Um, she traveled to the United States to meet me and learned because she somehow or other got a copy of some of the stuff we did over there. And she's it. She's Albania's independent comics, you know, auto comics person. And her work is fantastic. So that's kind of what we're doing with that. And you probably have the first audience I've told about the Courage Ceremony book that we're doing. I mean, I'm probably going to be doing it. You know, the, to my terms with publishers is that they have to give me, instead of royalties, a certain number of comics that go to different rape crisis centers around the, uh, the country. I can't really afford to be that generous, but I have to because it's the right thing to do. So there you go. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, getting back to the second half of the paper, um, you said that the, you, know, you had friends who were who were practicing medicine out of, out of necessity. I was wondering where they where the information was coming from. Well, first of all, Ray. These are very smart people, and they were in the medical field. I mean, Ray was working in a hospital, so the first thing he did was he hit the hospital libraries. There's a thing called the Journal of um, morbidity and something. It's mainly every time a weird illness or deaths or something come up, they treat the track every week. So they began with that. And then they threw a network with a lot of doctors who were treating mostly ill, you know, young gay men. And they were sort of advising them under the table, but they too would have lost their licenses. And then they watched these different drugs. Eventually, the one that they were bringing in was tested, you know, used in 
you know, they got the results and stuff like that. But when you've got an army of people where this is pre-internet, scrutinizing every single thing that you can get, writing letters, I mean, I remember that, writing letters, raising funds, bringing people in, calling, getting phone calls in the middle of the night from a doctor, just listen, let me tell you what we just found, da, 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 da. you know. Um, so, but, you know, people with medical, some, the people who were making the decisions or gearing had some kind of a medical background or, and also access as much of the resource they had. They're probably, their level of expertise is about the same as somebody today has the internet. And, you know, in their hands. I mean, the internet guy you can go on YouTube and how to remove a kidney. <laughs> <laughs> and then amazing, it, all that got stuff gets done like, you know, real fast. Because I can remember back like 84, 85, 86, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we heard of HIV and we heard AIDS. And when you saw. You didn't hear, yeah, you didn't hear HIV. And, uh, well, that, but 86, well, you, well, heard, 86 yeah. you definitely would have heard but, HIV. But, and as it, yeah. You know, everything you did hear about it, the next time, you know, two weeks later, what you heard was completely different than what you heard about it mm -hmm. weeks earlier. Yeah. And the, you know, just at the time, we were just being, uh, you know, a rock and roll fan, I was reading, I remember reading Spin Magazine, mm -hmm. and then having monthly an article that would build on what had gone before, and they would say, okay, this is bullshit, and now this is what it right. is. And, and they did that for, I don't mean, know, at least uh, several years during the 80s, yeah. and uh, I, I just, it struck me at the time, again, this is Elena, that I, nobody was doing this. Nobody was giving the public the context nobody, to the disease. Nobody was doing it, and you had to set up your own, your own systems and stuff like that. Um, there are some very good, and in some cases, um, they argue with themselves documentaries about the time, um, but stuff didn't really start happening until ACT UP got involved and, you know, began to really push, push this because, I mean, Reagan was the president who refused to say the word. And uh, there he was with a gay son and he wouldn't talk about it. But you, you know, you captured it. I didn't know about spin, but that whole, like, every morsel of information you could get was cherished, brought home to the table, everybody discussed, looked at, and figured out. It was like a war room. The apartment became a war room. Remember the, the dichotomy that I saw between what I saw in Spin Magazine every month as it built, mm -hmm. and any anything about the disease that I saw in any other media. Sure. There was just no context. It just like it's still books. going. It's still going like this. And yeah. you know, I was asked to talk about this book right around the time we were getting, you know, the big um, Ebola and post Ebola scares, like that. You know, the nurse that went shopping for a dress or something, and you know, going in like. Psh in the hazmat suits because she was looking at a bridal gown or something. And I thought, you know, all these skills are, you know, there's a phenomenal community of people who can help deal with the next epidemic because this is, we are probably going to see more of these. This is probably was the first one. But hopefully, I mean, of course, what was the first thing happened? You know, as soon as the first, you know, guy, what was it? Houston was hospitalized. I thought, oh, shit, who are they going to hang this one? Who are they going to blame this one for? You know? Um, yeah, other questions? You better come up with them or else I'm going to cut class early. Yeah? Um, you used to teach creative writing in the prison, right? Yeah. I, what I, well, what happened was I was running a women's liberation center and uh, I was seeing mostly, you know, young women who were complaining because their boyfriends wouldn't wash the dishes or take responsibility for birth control or something like that. And I'd heard about the uh, women's prison up the road, and I, at that point, I was working also as like with kids in trouble in the family, family court system as a probation officer, and you know also prosecuting guys who hurt children. But um, I heard that the women's prison was going to be closed, or what had been condemned as unfit to live, but they still had plenty of people in there. Um, and it was a bad situation. And then NOW had women down on the, on the sides, 
protesting with signs, but they were like two miles away from the prison. They're just standing there, you know, saying, you know, women's prison unfair. So I went up to the prison, I'm 20 years old. I got out of college kind of early. And, and uh, I said, hi, I got a degree in theater and do arts. I can, I can do a whole program that'll keep those girls busy. And I wanted to see what it was like from the inside. So at that time, I was using um, something nobody had ever seen, videotape, something called a porta pack, you know, reel to reel. And I said, I'll bring, you know, I want to bring this in for acting and improv classes. And I was teaching that and getting to know the women and, and doing some writing. Um, and uh, one night I came in, and the place was like this. And it's because one of the women who had been there since she was a child, because it used to be the, a kid's facility, had gone over the fence and they had got her, they stripped her, they chained her to a pipe in the bathroom or something, scrubbed her down with Lysol or some kind of floor cleaner. And then there was another woman detoxing. You're not supposed to be detoxing in a prison. You know, you're supposed to be in a hospital for detox or at least in a you know, in a, some kind of a facility. And another woman who had had a baby who was schizophrenic, and while the, they were letting her keep the baby to nurse for, until the baby was placed, the woman herself and the women around her were afraid she was going to hurt the baby, and all kinds of other stuff was going on. And I said, okay, guys, um, you have to, you know, show me. And so Tony says, here's the equipment. So they made their own documentary that, about what was going on. And you know, it's illegal to take pictures of people inside a prison because of, uh, you could, you know, somebody's who's, you know, you could identify somebody, they could become a victim or something like that. That's, that's what the, the Department of Corrections thinks. And it's, like, it's a couple of other things. But I just went to the guard and said, see this? When it rewinds, it erases. You know, we use the same tape all the time. So I began showing this video at little house parties and got an attorney in to do a class action suit about the prison. And the next time I came in, you know, they said, it's no more theater classes, Ms. Bradford. I said, you're absolutely right. Why should we put false ideas in these women's heads? You know, they're, none of them are going to be Hollywood superstars or actresses. They really need to get down to the basics, you know. And I've got, because I always have a notebook, here's, we're going to start a writing workshop. Boom. So I did this, and I, and I ended up with this job that was created for me. I was an advisor to Joe Biden. You, you know he's our vice president, but he, he's obviously, he was a senator before that, corrections, you know. The, he really is a nice guy, not that, not really as dumb as they make him look. But anyway, I was advising to him on prison, and uh, the governor, I was on governor's council on corrections, and the commissioner said, said, well, this woman's coming up with all these creative programs, and so they created a job for me that let me do stuff that uh, was arts-based, generally speaking, not always, but, um, that supported treatment objectives. And as perceived by three different groups of people, I decided one were the people inside the joint. So if the inmates said, we need something, you know, like we want to see our we want to see our girlfriends more often, I'd say, well, how about if we have like a sweetheart's ball and we, you know, we'll do something organized this and we'll have to use literary stuff and math stuff and creative things, we'll do you know, like that. The guards on the chair would come and they'd approach me with something I'd say. You know, they'd say, well, you know, these, these older guys are getting pushed off the basketball courts by the young Turks, and, you know, there's going to be some real tension, so finding, I said, oh, well, it's time for the Masters chess tournament, and you have to, you know, be, you know, like a, we would, you know, do the whole, you know, Samuel L. Jackson in the park thing with these guys. But then the people on the street would say, well, you've got predators in the prison are not getting any treatment. I said, well, it's going to take me a couple of months, but by showing, doing a couple of theater things and inviting people to come in, I can and I did get the first prison chapter of Parents Anonymous and Parents United, which is 
uh, people who have been sexually abused, but people who were sexual abusers started in a prison. That was a whole other story, because you know you can't, uh, this is so much more interesting than what was in the movie. We decided to just make it look funny. Um, like the guy, I, I taught high-end Japanese literature to guys in Supermax because the high-end period was the time when women were isolated, living behind screens, so they could only communicate by putting their, their robe, like the cuff of their robe through. And this is kind of the same thing as trying to get a message from one cell to the other with mirrors or something like that. Um, but anyway, um, to keep the guys from being ID'd uh, as short eyes, as predators, my people came in every week with huge trays of French pastries with just gobs of whipped cream and cherries and all that stuff and everything. And anybody who came into the program got good time. You spent an hour with the program, you got a day off your sentence. You also got this fabulous food, and with the doors shut, I had the crappiest, like, Walmart craft kits, you know, like, color and the little cross for Jesus with the transparent crayon kind of stuff. And you just tell them that this is Joyce's, you know, Miss Joyce's arts and crafts, you know, stupid prayer, whatever the hell, tell the guys that you're there for the food, the good time, and you just have to make this crap, you know, and you get it. You don't have to tell them anything about what you're talking about in there. So they all had a cover, because the guys would, you know, can I get it, I want to get that program. Was, well, let me see if I, no, I don't think we can put you in, you're not, you know, but there he goes. Those big eclairs, no, oh, can't do it, sorry. You know, try AI, sometimes they bring in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so there was that. Um, and that's kind of, I'm just always trying to use, you know, my wits and creativity to get, you know, to get things done. I, and, you know, from being a caseworker, respons being responsible for 500 families every quarter to reaching people through literature. You know, it, I decided I was better doing that. Although I still hear people from prison have hitchhiked to come, come visit me. I got this, this one inmate called me up and just talking street slang. This is, I, I, street slang is local, so you might not have had it in Ohio. I was just like, hello, Joyce. This is Clazad, which is, this is Claude. I Googled you. I could use a computer now. I got a BA in substance abuse prevention. I've got a pension. I could read. I still have that book of poetry we all did together. Because you see, the writer's workshop I did when I went back in, you asked about what we were writing. Well, on the surface, we were writing poetry. But underneath, we were writing testimony and papers of, that were used in the lawsuit. We were taking affidavits and documents that just looked like we were writing these poems on the top. Uh, and today, there's an exhibit at the museum, the Delaware Street Art Museum, about arts from uh, the art scene. Because you know, I had that whole loft thing. This is what I was like doing costumes for John Waters and showing movies and things like that. And, and, uh, in the museum, there's a little prison chapbook that was created at that time, and they don't really know the story behind it, because nobody did until I decided now, well, come chase me. I broke the law. <laughs> so there you go. How are you doing? I think we is somebody else coming in? I think I'm supposed to be done. Does anybody have a program? Yeah, there's uh... Somebody coming in? Yes. You gotta get me off here. Sequential <laughs> artist workshop. Okay, well I'm done. If you got a real question, you gotta come find me at my table. <laughs>